Going straight into our session on reporting terrorism, are we doing the terrorist job for them? So I'll introduce the panel. I can see them. You see Rob at the end, who we've just heard from. Simon Jenkins next to him, who has been um, editor, columnist, polemicist um, for I don't know how many different papers. Is there any paper you haven't worked for, Simon? Uh, but currently with The Guardian, which is the best paper of all. Well done for winding up there. Um, and has some fairly trenchant views on policing and terrorism generally. Uh, then Assistant Commissioner Mark Rowley, who was partly already introduced by Cressida Dick, who is also head of the National Counter-Terrorism Policing Unit. So we look forward to hearing your thoughts. James Stevenson, news editor from BBC, News and Current Affairs. And Sarah Whitehead, head of Home News from Sky News. So some broadcasters as well. Um, I'm going to ask the panel, first of all, just to say a few words of introduction to sort of, you know, give us their views, and then we'll open it up for a more general discussion. So, Simon, you have the honour to kick us off. Okay, thank you very much, Shay. Um, I'd just make two points. Um, uh, the, the first is about the word terrorism. Uh, it, it's portrayed as being an ideology, uh, a cause of, uh, of its own. It's not, it's a means to an end. Um, and I just think terrorism should always be defined as if it was a weapon. It's a weapon in a conflict. Uh, and and we, we do no service to anybody by going on about the war on terrorism. It's like saying the war on a gun or the war on explosions. It is a methodology. It is not an ideology. And so putting it in this special category and demonizing it in a peculiar way just leads to the wrong conclusions being drawn. The second point I'd make is just this. It is a peculiar weapon in that it's one that relies on us in the media for its effectiveness. No other weapon does so in quite the same way. Possibly the drone bomb does. But it, it, is, a, it is simply a, 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 an act requiring a reaction. And it's the reaction that makes the act potent. Someone once said that terrorism is 5% explosion and 95% publicity. And we just got to see it that way. Because I genuinely think, as journalists, we love the 5%, because it's blood, guts, and explosions, and bangs. And we don't really worry about the 95%, which is us. Now, the only question there is, what is our responsibility if that were the case? And I just do passionately believe that the press has a very, very serious responsibility in, in not over-reporting and in how they do report terrorist incidents. Um, and I, I'm afraid every time I see it being reported, not least by people on the panel here, including possibly myself, I just think we are doing their job for them. Now there is, is, is open to uh, uh, debate, but we're doing the job of the explosion by publicizing it in the way we do. And no one's saying we shouldn't. If, when I've said this before, everyone's saying, oh, you want, you want a censor. I don't. I want restraint uh, and a sense of proportion. But the, f the fact is that the, the, the on, on the BBC and in, and in the press, I've seen it time and again, you go on and on and on. And I was on the third day of the Westminster bomb story. I was in the BBC studio. I rather lost my temper. And I said, we just shouldn't be in this studio. We should get up and go now. Um, uh, and, and the BBC went berserk over one crazy guy in a car who stabbed a policeman. Now, if it hadn't been that he had an Arab name, he would have been a, a, a madman in a car stabbing a policeman. But so long as you, if, if I was going to kill someone, I'd always say, uh, you know, Ali Akbar or something, just to make sure I got on the front page. We have a responsibility. We cannot pretend we don't. We have to self-censor. It shouldn't be a state regulation. But we do have a responsibility not to over-report and exaggerate these events. Very interesting. I know in, in France, certain media organisations won't yeah. publish any photographs of uh, mm. terrorists. Anyway, Mark, let's come to you first, and then we'll get into the discussion. So this is really hard, isn't it? This is inherently hard, and I'm glad, we, glad it's not state regulation. I suppose picking up some of Simon's points, which I agree with. That's, so it's being a police officer would be boring and start with the law. So it's about serious violence, advancing political, religious, racial, or ideological causes, influencing government or intimidating the public. That is so inherently plays into all the points Simon makes about how it's reported because that helps them achieve those aims or, or not. And it's about the how, not the whether, as, as has been said. I think this is really impressive that you've asked yourselves this question. I'm really grateful for the invite because I think the current terrorist threat makes this harder than it's been before because we have a terrorist threat that's much more driven by propaganda. The old terrorism, if you like, of Al-Qaeda and IRA was about secret networks, plotting atrocities. We still have some of that, but a lot of what we have is about propaganda, about trying to radicalise and influence <coughs> and instruct the vulnerable and the violent in our communities. So the message and the communication of it is more um, 
fundamental to the terrorist purpose than it ever than it ever has been, which I think changes the balance. This year, um, I've stood outside Scotland Yard um, too many times. Um, I've been really grateful for the um, partnership, particularly with the Crime Reporters Association and a lot of careful reporting mm -hmm. that hasn't got in the way of investigation. So I wanted to sort of um, thank them, um, thank them for that. Um, but I do think there's some ways you could rein back what you do, but still report the news. I think there's some fine balances. I, I sort of I think Simon phrased it as well as as, as well as anybody could do. I think there's some fine balance here, but if they're looking to influence. Are you helping them influence, or are you reporting the story? I think it's a different, a different, uh, a different approach. And there are some extreme cases. I think sometimes I see the AMAC news agency being quoted, which is basically ISIS is spokes, um, ISIS is spokes organisation, which is it's odd that mainstream organisations will quote them. And I sometimes see the instructions on how to commit terrorist attacks, which we work really hard to get off social media sites being copied verbatim on mainstream media websites, which seems a bit, um, a bit dim, frankly. So um, I think there's a different balance to think about when, when terrorism is more than ever driven through propaganda. Mm, interesting, thank you. James, is the BBC doing too much <laughs> on terrorist attacks and terrorists? And we don't think we are, but I mean, th the challenge is a fair one and it's one we've thought a lot about and, and um, we think we're coming to the right place. I think. The thing I wanted to say by way of an opening is I think we've, we've all come a long way uh, in the last couple of years. So I was, I was looking back and it's more or less exactly two years since the Paris attacks and something quite big changed with the Paris attacks and not least the level of engagement we had with uh, Mark and his colleagues and, and some of you here might have been involved in some of those discussions about trying to compare our expectations of how what job we think we're doing and how we how we do it and what we need to do it, and likewise what the, the authorities and the led by, by the Met think they need and, and where those things are potentially in tension, uh, what sort of channels of communication there need to be to have the, to have the discussion. I think, uh, like you, I welcome this as another one of, of those kind of sessions in which we can hopefully understand that we've all got a job to do and what is that job. Not to say we always do it perfectly, because I don't, I don't think we, we do or, or ever could. But in answer to the, the basic one, I'm glad that th this is framed now as how to report, not whether <coughs> to report. I don't think we could really agree with a conversation that was about whether to report. And I, and, uh, I, I know s that, that doesn't, that's not how the, the discussion is framed. But clearly, there are a whole host of, of challenges. And I would just say that for the, although the, the point about not covering excessively is, is well made, there is a huge amount to unpack once you get to these kind of instances, what's happened, there's why it's happened, who perpetrated it, what their motivations were, doing justice to the, as Rob was talking about very eloquently, to the lives of, of the victims. There's a lot for us to, to get through and, and, that, and that does take time and it does loom quite large on our, on our output at those kind, of, those kind of moments. Sarah, I'm sure at Sky you have those same discussions as well as to how much to report, but particularly on the issue of giving the details of the terrorists, their background, their photographs, and all, all of that. Do you think perhaps sometimes you go too far? No, I don't, because we do have lots of discussion about it. And it's important for us to understand where this has come from and, 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 and what it's about, and really try and, and actually talk about maybe, you know, not glorify them at all. This isn't about glorifying um, terrorists. I think Rob was incredibly um, eloquent on, on that. But it is about understanding where this is coming from and why, and I think that that is incredibly important. I, I actually think there's another bit of this conversation which is actually up front, which is that we have attacks now in the UK or events that happen, and we can all jump to a kind of, oh my God, this is a terror attack. We had Russell Square, we've had um, the Natural History Museum, we've had moments where actually it hasn't been terrorism. Um, and we start to put these things on our websites, on our TV, and, um, and there's, a, there's a really big discussion going on now about, you know, are we over-egging those? Because at that point, we haven't got a clue what it is. Um, and one of the things that I'm really keen to continue to discuss, and we've really made huge strides um, with Mark and, and his colleagues, 
but actually is um, attempting to get guidance, getting guidance from the police if they can give it to us. I think for all of us is incredibly important and I, I don't think we're still getting the guidance we need. It's not about um, absolutes. So I am, we are totally understand that the police cannot say, oh, we definitely know this is terror, definitely isn't. But actually, we can frame all our reporting. We can frame the extent of our reporting. We can frame a whole lot of stuff with some guidance from the police, and we're still not getting enough. We have really professional home affairs, crime, whatever correspondents who have great relationships, um, and they just need to be trusted more, and we need more guidance, which can influence how we report. OK, I'm just going to put a couple of questions back. So first of all, Mark, is it true that maybe you're not reacting quickly enough to give guidance to the press and this is when the speculation starts isn't it people start to say oh it must have been a terrorist attack then I mean can you can you go quicker or are you essentially having to wait till you've got verification uh, listen we're, we're not perfect any more than any of um, your organizations are so we can always do it better I'm sure we can do I, I do think there's sort of the illustration of the things that haven't turned out to be ter terrorist attacks is actually quite a good illustration of this that we have said very quickly we're open-minded, we're not sure this may be terrorism, may not be, we're working on it. So we, we're working on the motive. We say that to your teams very quickly. And yet, rather than holding back with nobody's sure at the moment, let's, it, it could, be, could be a road traffic accident, let's just leave it to that for the minute. <laughs> and, and then 12 hours later we'll say, yeah, definitely it wasn't yeah. terrorism, or it was, in which case you can stand up. But actually, it gets a... What's not a terrorist attack? Sorry? What is not a terrorist attack? Um, so it hasn't got the hasn't got the motivation to influence government. It's, it's about motive. It's about it's about the motive. That's precisely my point. Which is okay. which is why, if if a has a driver lost control mm. or has a driver <coughs> put their foot down deliberately to kill mm. people in a purpose, now uh, normally within a few hours we can start to get some strong signals, which it is. Mm. But if it may take a few hours. In some cases, it's very obvious at the start. In some cases, it's a few hours. And in those few hours, you could say almost nothing, mm. other than there's a serious accident and police are dealing with it and they're open-minded to motive, or you can start to whip up this might be terrorism. Mm -hmm. And I think there's, a sort of, there's been a tendency for that momentum to start to build. Mm -hmm. And then when it isn't terrorism, we feel we've got to try and put the lid back on top of it. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of, rather than us being slightly more cautious, because even with those things that aren't committed by terrorists, they're just tragic accidents. And once we help the terrorists by mm -hmm. creating a sense of foreboding. But quite often the, the problem is live news reports, isn't it? You've got your live news channel, you've got your reporter on the spot and the studio anchor's going, so what is it, what is it? And so inevitably they start to speculate, don't they? Uh, uh, com completely. Mm. Uh, and, and, and yet it's surely odd if you're not talking to someone at the scene, if it's a big incident. Uh, it's odd not to have anybody there. It's odd not to have anybody there, but sort of to be open-minded about the motive mm. rather than sort of yeah. encouraging a sense of fear that this is this is probably terrorism, but the police haven't called it yet, yeah. which is how some of the reporting yeah. sometimes comes across, yeah. rather than being really cautious about Simon, it. Simon, I, I just want to come back to you on the point, really, that James and Sarah were making about, yes, they're not glorifying terrorism, but they're just giving people information that they would want to know about the backgrounds of whoever committed these acts. Well, I'm not quite sure where glory comes into this debate, um, but, but I, I just remain worried. Um, apparently, if some crazy guy goes down the street and shoots someone, and doesn't say Allah is great, uh, he, he's not a terrorist, he's a killer. They're all killers to me. The decision we make to turn a killer into something, frankly, which they think is glorifying them. They want martyrdom. And, and I, I, I don't think we've begun to get the language right here, I just don't. Mm. Uh, the, 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 you, I almost sensed it in, in my own news organizations, almost begging this guy to say God is great. Because then we can go to go to, yeah. you know, go yeah. and smash everything. Yeah. And even, I mean, I, 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 I deeply respect what Manchester News did. Um, there, I just thought, like, day after day after day, we had news about Manchester hanging together, Manchester, you know, um, all these wonderful things about Manchester, um, which is totally true and impressive. And I, you know, I love Manchester, and I was impressed. Um, we ju I just thought that is just what they want. That is just what they want. And it's somehow or other not knowing where you draw the line, what, what, what is proportional about this. Uh, Rob, but we don't really in. know what Simon Abedi wants because he didn't say anything, he just blew mm. himself up. But um, I think he wanted people to be frightened. And I think we were reporting the fact that we were in a city which yeah. was functioning, was getting on with life. The, the greatest man, great Manchester run would have taken place anyway, we would have reported it. I think it was uh, an opportunity for us to say, this is, you know, lo local newspapers do well when they celebrate the cities in which they are. There were clear activities taking place. 10,000 bees being tattooed is, a, is something that's happened because something has 
because of a tragedy. So I think putting on the front page day after day, we could have done, as some papers have done, pictures of a baby, uh, pictures of his background. We chose not to do that because we felt there was another story there. But switching away from it after two or three days would have felt very, very uncomfortable. And I've got to set the context of 22 people died that day in Manchester, whether it had been a, a terrorist attack or whatever, or had been a, 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 an accident. I written after three or four days, it still would have been front page news. So it had been a coke crash or yeah, something. Yeah, the context. I think people, you've got yeah. to see the context mm. of it. Mm. Have you got a bee tattoo, by the way? Uh, I couldn't possibly show you. No. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, you wanted to come in there. Um, I, I just wanted to kind of turn it around a bit because we're talking about um, people shouting al Akbar. I think one of the other um, issues that we have had in recent months <coughs> is is the opposite of that. I think the rise of, of, of right wing terrorism is happening. You would probably wouldn't call it terrorism, but right wing attacks is happening, and and um, I'm sure many people in this room had had the same issue at the Finsbury Park um, uh, mosque attack, where actually we arrived on the spot. We had people, at, and as the BBC did, and particularly came on, um, in for a lot of uh, attention at that mosque that night, uh, where because we were not calling it terrorism, um, people because it hadn't been proved that it was at that point, um, and the police hadn't said that it was. Actually, we came in for unbelievable aggression. It's a very aggressive um, uh, people on the ground going, you know, just because it's not the Muslim who's done the attack, you're not calling it terrorism. And I think that um, that actually we need to remember that it's it's actually coming. It's all different sides here. It's all it's a very very different, it's a huge, hugely complicated vista that we're looking at here. And I think that actually if we just kind of focus on this word of kind of terrorism not dealing with some of the real issues that are going on, which are how can we verify that it is, what actually is going on, what other things do we need to look at within the context of our reporting, um, you know, are we putting people's, if, this, if an incident's ongoing, are we, look, you know, are we putting people's lives in danger, are we being accurate, all of those questions. James, just before we throw it open, just your thoughts on sort of the, the definition, if you like, of terrorism, I mean, how do you decide what you call terrorism? Well, and well, and we specific, specifically in relation to the Finsbury Park. We thing. well, there's a whole another sort of, in a sense, another ter another conversation about terminology, one which we're mm. actively having mm. within the organisation, and some of that is to the point that Sarah makes is about are we are we applying the same standards in our language to different sorts of mm -hmm. attacks? Because sadly, we're now getting what looks like a full palette of of attacks, and and um, so we th there's quite a lot of uh, of concern about that. The, the thing I, I, I wanted to return to, if I could, was mm. about this. I, I, I know a lot of people feel that you shouldn't um, report on the perpetrators of these attacks, uh, or you, you shouldn't. You shouldn't. Uh, that there's a danger of excessive reporting, but but that's not something you would apply to crime reporting elsewhere. I mean, uh, w we certainly think, and it, it might be that it's not the focus that the Manchester Evening News wants to take, but. We as a news organisation news organization feel that it is part of our role to try and track down who that person was, what their links, uh, in, in, in a way, much as the authorities do, what their links were, how wide it goes, whether it was politically motivated. So we had teams in, in Libya trying to get to that family, establish what the rather complicated re relationships were within factions fighting there. And I, I think whether we like it or not, and we probably don't, these things do connect to wider uh, things going on in the Middle East and elsewhere, and I, we don't feel we can step away from from that aspect of, mm. of what we're looking at. The here. question must be: so, if, you, if their ambition is to advance a cause, political, or ideological, racial, whatever, isn't the trick to try and find a way where you report the story without helping them advance the cause. That's, that's the, and that's a, that's an, I'm glad I don't have to answer that question because yeah. that's really hard, but that's the, that's the fundamental challenge Certainly here. Certainly if we could do that, we, we would do that. I, I think that one thing we haven't really touched on yet is, you know, we're in a work, we all know in, our, in other aspects of, of our work that we're now in this fully digital landscape. What we as news organisations choose to report or not choose, or don't choose to report is not the totality of what the public receives, yeah, you've got and so you know we're we are in a very different mm. world now. And so what we, of course, we're responsible for what we publish and what we don't publish. But it's not as though we can, even if we wanted to, we we can't, can't prevent the dissemination yeah. of this information. Yeah. And Rob, I think you just in a way to we have to, we, we have to recognise a very unpalatable thing, which yeah. is the, a lot of these people are very 
smart about how modern open societies and their media work, and they, they know what will create impact. Mm. I think in terms yeah. of the likes of, uh, of the Manchester bomber, um, it's the nature of news. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm staying with this story because it's my town, but quickly people moved, the, the, the fact moved on to Grenville and London, obviously, and that's, that's right and proper. But I think sometimes we, we just we want to deal with an issue and then move on. We actually wanted to have a really deep look at Abadi's life from the making of him. And we actually left it deliberately three months and we commissioned a piece. My, one of my best reporters, Chris Osu, worked on the, for three months on one article. It was, eight, it was even longer than a Guardian long read. It was that long. <laughs> uh, um, and, you know, it's, it's half an hour of, of incredible journalism. To re to, uh, it's all about the making of this guy because the worst thing about him is he was, he was born and raised in Manchester from a Libyan background, but there's no escaping that. And it's a multicultural yeah. city. He grew, he was, he's one of ours. And so we, we did it with a view of not to celebrate, to, to glorify, whatever, to understand the making of someone like him. Because just saying he's a monster is not enough. Just saying he's a murderer is not enough. Certainly not saying he's a terrorist is nowhere near enough, so it, and it's wrong. Mm. But it, the fact is he happened, he, he could happen again. So we would try to get under the bonnet of what's the, how, how is some like the, the path these people take. And that's <coughs> important that we do address those issues. I think sometimes we desperately try to do it in the first 72 hours and then on to the next story. Yeah. Please stand back, come back and revisit these things when some of the heat has uh, yeah. died down a bit. Yeah. That's, that's, we've yeah. got a job to do there, I think. Okay, I'd like to bring in um, the audience as well. I'll take a couple of questions and then we'll sort of dot around the panel. And if you've got one specific question for one specific panellist, do say so. But we'll just um, bring you in a bit and then come back to the panel. Um, yes, gentleman here. <coughs> and can you also say who you are, please? Sure, uh, Doug Wills, uh, Managing Editor of uh, the London Evening Standard and The Independent. Um, first of all, um, that was Rob, that was brilliant. Absolutely brilliant, and uh, it, I think it had, it's all welling up in admiration. Um, with your night and our day, because the evening sun is during the day, uh, we hit that absolute question of what do you report when it happens? BBC does it all the time in the sky, similar. And this, so the question is particularly to uh, the Assistant uh, Commissioner. We have to report something. We absolutely have to report it. In Manchester, London, the city wants to know what the hell has happened. We have to report something. Do you really feel that you cannot just give some information slightly quicker? Um, and is, I know we, there was a terrific uh, uh, gathering at Hendon, which is hu hugely useful, but I know the frustration is still there. Even if it's, we don't know we believe events. It's so critical that we say something. Okay, that's a very specific question. So Mark, would you like to take that now? I, th I mean, I thought we gave a lot of information very quickly and more quickly than we've done before, frankly, and did more briefings. Um, I mean, we had a debrief after Westminster with some of the crime reporters, um, and they felt the one thing that was missing was some more background briefing. And after the London Bridge attack, we did do a background briefing for crime reporters. And I remember Fiona afterwards actually saying, um, their only criticism was we'd given them too much information, we didn't know which bit to use. Um, it was something like that. <laughs> but, um, so, so, we, so we do recognise that you want that information. Um, after London Bridge, frankly, we were quite quickly confident it was about those three individuals, and so the wider investigation was closing down, which made it possible to share information. The more live inquiries we've got, the more tricky it is to share material because of the legal processes we're tied in. So it's never, it's never going to be straightforward. Um, We'll try and get as much out as possible, and we'll keep doing exercises and working with you about how we can give you more. But we have to feed a court process, we have to feed a, an inquest, and if we put stuff out there which trips up those legal processes, you, amongst others, will be on our back for, um, for messing up a, a, a process which brings somebody to justice. So, so that's what we're always wrestling with, and that's the challenge. Um, but we're keen to keep working on it to give you the best site so you can do the best job at balancing the difficult things we're discussing. And more of it in background and not on Twitter? <coughs> um, so that's why we did a did background briefing with CRA and we're keen to do that more often. Okay, another question. Uh, yes, gentlemen, down the middle, you know it's in that microphone there. Hi, Jonathan from News Associates. Um, I think there's a growing concern that terrorism as a phrase is becoming conflated with the Islam faith. 
Um, do you think it's time to sort of rethink the terms and language we're using to describe these attacks? Okay, thanks. We'll take another question before we come to the panel. We've had one already, so we'll go for the gentleman here. Can you wait for a mic and say who you are, please? Stand here, right at the front. Hi. Uh, the, the whole morning has been about... Um, sorry, say who you are. Oh, sorry, James Hall from Alamy. The, the, the morning's all been about fake news and people's lack of trust in news. If we un under-report a certain type of crime, does that not feed into people's fear of fake news and untrustworthy news? news? Yeah. 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 Okay, well, let's take those two questions and I'll sort of go around the panel again in order. So, Rob, would you like to start? Um, in terms of, of, of um, terminology, I think I've tried to sort of emphasise in my presentation that, first and foremost, this was, this was a murder attack. Uh, and I think it's important that we do understand... Um, first and foremost, uh, the, yeah, pe people were, ki were killed, and uh, the motivation is rather than Simon's point is right, terrorism is, is, is just a weapon. I think it's also important that we talk in terms of um, beyond just terror, the whole issue of hate crime. You know, wanting to hurt someone because they're different to you comes in many forms. And I think we're addressing that uh, in, in Manchester now with Greater Manchester Police, which actually recognised 10 different categories of hate crime, one of which is hating someone based on their cultural faith. It might be based on their appearance, their sexual orientation, gender identification, all these things matter. So it's important that we do, you know, it's about, you know, it's about us owning the debate, not, not, not the guy who sets off the bomb or, or drives a van down the road. So I think uh, there is a conflation, you're absolutely right, but we can probably, <laughs> we all remember from terrorism on this panel from years ago was associated with the events in Ireland. Uh, so it, it's kind of of the moment, but you're absolutely right, the, the wider context is, is um, you know, there are many issues involved here about f different forms of hate. Under-reporting, um, you know, we've, we've sort of uh, looked at this already. Um, I just feel it's about the context in which it's reported. There's no getting away from the, the incidents referred to uh, this year are, were substantial in terms of loss of life. You know, they're the big stories regardless of how it happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but clearly, I think the, da the danger is, is, is not, it's not the, the length of reporting, it's the manner of reporting, I, and I do think this, there's a magic, the first hour is when we get a lot of it wrong, and I come back, this, this point's been addressed quite a lot, in the first few minutes, while journalists are hunting for information, because we know, we're knowing about things as fast as the coppers, because, I, I don't know, the background of, of outside the museum, but people see stuff, and they're tweeting before they're dialing treble nine now, we know about stuff so fast, <coughs> and we know a lot of disinformation very, very quickly, that is a real, that's a real world challenge. So I've, I've, you know, sympathy for a copper, but I think it, there's something in that, that things happen so quickly, we can make a lot of mistakes in the first hour. Therefore, don't jump to the T word, you know. Simon, not, not reporting being fake news. Um, there's no danger of this being underreported. Let's, <laughs> let's relax on that, really. Um, uh, uh, the, the point of it is, is to ensure that it's overreported. The intention of the person doing this is to be overreported. Mm. They'll do anything to get that maximum. They'll, they'll kill, I mean, I go back to the IRA. I remember one of the IRA apologists saying, I said, why did you go for police, police horses and bandsmen? They said, because killing people outside Harrods didn't get them the same publicity. As simple as that. Then there was a relationship between the press and the police. It might have been malign, I don't know. But there was a constant debate at, at back in the Evening Standard, I remember at the time, um, how should we report this? And D notices were used. I mean, when the police knew something they did not want reported, it was respected. Uh, I know there wasn't social media at the time, but even so, there was a relationship. And I just thought at the time, how much publicity do you want to give the IRA this week almost? Mm -hmm. and, and it was an internal debate within news organizations. I mean, I, the ones I know, there's not been much internal debate about these, these mm -hmm. big outrages. Um, God, let's go with it. And I, on the third day of the Westminster um, knife attack, I mean, I was in the BBC studio with two sophisticated Arabists discussing um, how ISIS got to this point. I mean, the whole of ISIS must have been cheering them on. It was just that ridiculous. There was no sense, I thought, of any proportion, um, no debate about how far we should go. With this. Should, is it now time to calm down? Um, when terrorist incidents occur, we go completely mad, and I think it's very dangerous. Thank you. Mark? So uh, the word terrorism, so being a sort of slightly um, predictable police, Officer, I rely on the law. And so our parliament has, described, has defined exactly what terrorism is. 
and it's a matter for yourselves whether you use mm. the word terrorism as defined by Parliament or you use uh, your own definitions as journalists. That's the defi definition um, I work to. And they've created a whole set of extra offences and powers based on the fact, uh, political judgment that Parliament's underscored for many years, that terrorism is in some ways a more serious crime because it's an attack on society and values and those issues. So, so it does have a separate, um, a, a separate definition. It, is, it sort of straddles a whole range of um, uh, uh, beliefs. It's not, about, um, it's not defined about Islamist terrorism. It's about um, anybody, as I say, looking to, to pursue um, ideological or racial or political causes, etc. Um, I think it's interesting this last year, so, so just over a year ago, that the Home Secretary prescribed um, national action. So we have a um, prescribed terrorist group in this country who are white supremacist, neo-Nazi organisation, um, and there have been two groups of people charged with offences related to membership of those groups quite recently. So we're wrong to talk about the details of those cases. But I think it's a, a sort of a challenge for yourselves about whether you've been even handed at recognising those other risks to our communities. Um, in terms of fake news and um, uh, fake news and trust, these things aren't going to be overreported. It's it's definitely, and I would never, as a police officer, say um, don't report these things. <coughs> it's it's they're they're big events, and the public have a right to know and understand what's going on. Of course, they do. Um, but as I say, how you need to think about how you do this as editors without helping the cause of those doing it. And so um, the fact that um, I can look on mainstream news websites and see direct lifts of ISIS propaganda, I can see um, direct lifts of detailed instructions on how best to conduct a, t a truck attack. Um, you don't need to be copying that material out. That's not, that's not necessary. You can report the generalities. You don't need to help them, um, help them do their work. And you don't need to be quoting then their... Um, own propaganda team as if it's a sort of accredited news agency. James, I'm um, coming to the two questions, but I also just want to ask, are you aware of denotices still being used these days and observed or not? Yeah, they've got a slightly different name, but they still mm. exist. Mm. And we make a judgment as to whether we're going to comply with them mm. or not. And if they're a reasonable request, mm. we look at them. What are they called now? Like they're called... Advisory. DSMA, DSMA, notices. DSMA notices. Thank you. Defence and Security <laughs> Media Advisory Notices. Thank you. Right. Uh, anyway, so on to the other questions. I'm happy to give way if you need no, 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 more on. expertise on the panel. <laughs> but the important, I mean, the important thing is that those are a rarely used mechanism that's agreed that's about a significant risk to national security and life. It's, yeah. it's, if those were ever used yeah. as a sort of to, um, to contribute to the debate we're having today about what's the balance, then yeah, that, that, would be, that would be overreaching. So they're used in very narrow circumstances. Yeah. And often very time limited. Just exactly, realize, exactly yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. Did you have thoughts on the um, on the matter of conflating terrorism with Islam? Uh, yes, I think I think the point made about language is, is a good one, and it's a, it's one that we we look at across our the range of our output, and we are wrestling with the the questions that, that you touch on about uh, many of which came into very sharp relief with the murder of Joe Cox and and the events since then. But yes, we 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 are alive to to, to those to those issues. Also, in, uh, sort of on the territory of, of language, I think it's worth saying that we uh, we take very seriously the and attribute to the authority the language they're using. So when you start to use terminology, Absolutely. we start to to report that not because we're subcontracting our own editorial judgment, but because that's a very important part of of the reporting mm -hmm. out of whether or not it's regarded. Whether when you appear outside Scotland Yard and and, and talk, that, that that those words are are a big building block. Of our coverage, and, and to the the point we touched on earlier, the, the earlier the can't they come, the more they you can say, mm. you know, understanding the constraints on you, the more that sh that um, that helps us convey to the audience the magnitude of, of, of what's what's happening. Thank you, Sarah. But it, g it goes back to my to my first point, really, which is that you know because we do attribute that language and do exactly the same, um, that guidance. That language, some absolutes, is absolutely key, and 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 in those at first hours, you're right, um, Rob, that that is where you're in the greatest danger because you don't know what's going on, and you've got to remain sure, firm, definite, and ultimately accurate. Otherwise, 
people lose trust and don't believe you um, at a later day. So um, it's, it's really, really difficult and it's a massive challenge, but it's mm -hmm. something that we are kind of all wrestle with all the time. Um, and as far as report, we have to report these events. There's no question about reporting these events to, to us. They are massive events and it would be very odd if we didn't and then nobody would trust us ever. I think there's a difference between not reporting and then doing a lot on the terrace. I am thinking of the French example, and I'm wondering if any of you in the audience would support doing what I think it's Le Monde and various other media outlets have said they will not publish photographs, for example, of terrorists. Does anyone in the audience think that is a good idea and should be adopted here? No, interesting. I know you do, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> right, another question. Yeah. So uh, there will be occasions where, I know, if, we, if we're trying to hunt somebody down and we haven't been able to find them through our normal tactics, that we may, may want to put their photo out there. But that hasn't been the case in any of the recent cases. There's no, <coughs> I don't think any of the recent cases have been a policing purpose for the um, photo to be broadcast. So it's a, it's a judgment for yourselves in terms of public interest. But I think there is a danger that it does go to that, um, that martyr status that they're seeking. Another question. Yes, gentleman up there. Hi, it's uh, Josh Jones from News Associates. Um, particularly for you, Robert, across the panel, how do you strike that balance between reporting the truth and the details of an attack whilst not intruding into the grief and shock of the victims and their families? Yeah, okay, Robert. Uh, that was uh, central to a lot of our thinking through from day one right through to now. It's about you're dealing with real human emotions here. Uh, and that is a challenge for us, um, dealing with extreme grief. It's, in a sense, it's, it's part of the journalist stock in trade. We're often dealing with people because something terrible has happened to, to them or a loved one. So I think we were very mindful of that in terms of our for, yeah, initial approaches. Uh, probably before even people have been confirmed as, as, as being killed, in the first few hours, it was a case of people looking for loved ones. And we sort of put ourselves out there as a news media to say, we will, if somebody's getting in touch saying, I just can't find my daughter, we will then circulate, can, can we circulate that photograph on our social media because we'll try and help her find her or him. And I think it was important that we, we worked with some of the families and we have got to know some of them quite well since. It's about understanding, that, that, was, a, that was a unique, extraordinary circumstance where people were trying to find lost people. In some cases, many cases, it was a happy ending. For, tragically, for 22 families, there was no happy ending. But I think we had a part to play there. I think it was also a real understanding about, you know, if, you know, in terms of photographs, in terms of contacts, there are IPSO guidelines. We also worked, I thought, Greater Manchester Police did a great job with their family liaison officers to make sure those who didn't want to talk will get a statement for you initially. But we've kept close in touch with the families. I've been in a slightly privileged position because of my role in the trustees of the charity where that's supporting the families of direct access back and pass messages through. But being mindful of people's grief is, is, is part, of, part of journalism, therefore you have to be a human being as well as a journalist. Um, I think the other thing to mention, and it's been discussed quite a lot recently, is the, the, the welfare and emotions of the journalist. Uh, that's been more and more of an issue. Uh, and I think we have to be quite resilient in our, in our jobs, but some of that is pretty tough, hard yards for people to have to deal with these kind of stories. And that's also a factor, but first and foremost, the well, well-being of the people we're interviewing, you know, there's, there, there are rules we follow, they, we try once and go away. If we can pull information with other journalists, we were. Um, there's things you can do, but if you, you've got to be mindful of that. Uh, it's very, very important. It's a really valid point you make. On that issue, I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I seem to remember, and this is a question for our two broadcasters, on the Westminster Bridge attack, seeing uh, pictures of the dead policeman's body lying there, did I not? And was that entirely the right thing to do? In, in the background, I mean, not, sort of, not obviously a full close-up, but I, I'm sure I saw pictures and I remember thinking, oh, really? It's one of the areas, I'm, I'm sure Sarah would agree, that we have to navigate around mm. most carefully. I mm. mean, we had, uh, my memory is slightly different, I'm yeah. not saying you're wrong, but uh, with the perpetrator yeah, was, the was tackled. Yeah. And that, that was right, the yes. primary yeah. focus of our, yeah. our yeah. reporting, and we yeah. took the view that uh, we would show that, and yeah. we also took the view that we wouldn't 
uh, Heidi's identity. Mm. We're, we're often we're, we've got a decision to make. Essentially, it's, it's an area, increasingly an area about privacy, yeah. you know, pe about people's right to privacy. So uh, we've got judge, quite difficult judgments to make there. In, in, in our case, we felt that you know, the perpetrator had voided those rights, but we were quite careful around other people, as I, as I recall. And, uh, and yeah, you may my be memory right. might be yeah. slightly different mm. to yours. I think it's mm. the perpetrator. Mm. Maybe yeah. it was the perpetrator. Yeah. But even so, still a sort of difficult one, isn't it? It is. I mean, uh, as, as James has said, it's incredibly difficult, and every every one of these is different and yeah. has a different issue. But I think, as far as talking to victims, survivors of um, of some of these attacks, it is it, it is an app. You know, we have to be so so careful. Um, and and one of the key things is this pooling of um, interviews, etc., because it is the repetition yes. of the story yeah. that can yeah. be the big issue. So we do. You know, it is family liaison or others who will kind of work with us to make sure that actually we're, you know, treating everybody in an extremely sensitive way at that time because some people don't actually know how shocked they are, at, you know, in those initial mm. Mm. hours. And I generally find broadcasters very sensitive on that. So we have a relationship with the family, family liaison. Mm. Some families find it helpful to speak and some don't, and the ones who do will help facilitate it, and, make it, and the ones who won't, the sort of broadcasters generally respect that. We, we had a particular issue around Manchester, which I'm, sh I'm sure you did too, which is because so many kids were caught up in it, we had the, another layer of consideration about the interests of the child, mm. having making sure that there was informed yeah. consent by the family. <coughs> we often, I think always actually, interviewed uh, young people with a family member with them, partly because that was the duty of care, but partly to demonstrate to our audience how seriously mm. we were taking that question, but it was a it was an unusual, it was a particularly difficult dimension of that story that that the witnesses, many of the witnesses to the kit, to the events were mm. were underage. Okay, I think we've time for another question or two, and then a final sort of word from the panel, and then we will wrap up for a tea break. Yes. Hi, I'm Matthew Moore from the Times. This is a question more for the uh, assistant commissioner. Uh, around the Manchester attack, a lot of the news lines came out, not from the British press, but from the US press, and they were then picked up here. Um, what was your reaction to that? How did you, how, how harmful was that to your investigation? And what do you think the British press should do when they see these lines breaking on, say, NBC? Mm. So we dealt with that, we dealt with that at the time, that was covered at the time, I'm not gonna say any, I um, don't think it's helpful to say any more on that. Um, <laughs> operationally, we work with international partners and um, those relationships are, um, normally work smoothly and perfectly. Um, I think in terms of the difficult question you generally face where you're rushing behind a story and something comes out from another corner of the world, whether it's, literally, whether it's a, uh, sort of a, another jurisdiction or whether it's just something on social media, um, I would just appreciate the engagement with us. I mean, there were some really constructive conversations on, um, on one, of the, um, one of the attacks this year. I think it was, um, I think it was Westminster where we asked journalists to give us about 24 hours where we were making some urgent inquiries um, even uh, before putting the name out that you had identified yourselves and, uh, and you respected that and that was very helpful. So I think it's about engagement. If something comes out from another, another source, is even if you're really confident in it, if it's, if it's not penetrating, if it's not already out there penetrating British society clearly, liaising with us, if that, if that getting more widely known is going to undermine our investigation for the next few hours, then it's helpful to have that conversation. Another question. A final question. Yes. Hi, I'd just like to raise a wider issue, really, not just about terror reporting, but that Can Sarah picked up on. Oh, sorry, yeah, David Bartlett, editor of Cambridge News. Um, and I think every editor in this room would share my frustration that out of hours, um, police can be really hard to get hold of. So it might not be a terrorist attack that's breaking, but um, there might be a big sort of police incident that happens and budgets are so that press officers are, you know, really, you know, the hours they operate are really narrow. So that issue of guidance is crucial to something to us when there is a voracious appetite for people. They want to know what's happening and we can't do our jobs because we can't get the information from the police. And I think that's something that's a wider issue, not just about terror reporting, but it applies to lots of other things. And burglaries as well. <laughs> Mark I, can't, I, can't, I can't speak for Cambridgeshire, but I mean, in the Met we're sort of big enough to have the sort of economies of scale, so there's a sort of 
in the newsroom. So um, in, in London, uh, any sort of national stories that have got a London footprint, you can always get an answer. Mm. Right, I just want to come for a final word from, from all the panellists. Simon, you've been the one who's been the most provocative and perhaps not the most supported here, would you say? There's nothing to make you more unpopular than to preach restraint to the press. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, I just on the last point, it's, it's quite interesting. If, if you look at the way in which um, the system responds to this general topic, um, uh, I, I'm quite shocked in London, I have to say, at the amount of police resources directed to what's called counter-terrorism. I know it's your budget. <laughs> um, but, I mean, you can walk through Westminster and you will probably count 100 policemen you can walk through Kilburn, you won't see one. Mm. How many people get killed in Westminster versus Kilburn? Uh, it, it is, and it's the consequence of the publicity we give these events. It really is. And it doesn't just drive police resources and police response. Um, uh, the, the, the law says, I, I think it uh, uh, seek to undermine our values and liberties or something. Well, that's that's, that's a, word that's sort of influence government to intimidate the public. Right, that's right. Um, uh, what is the government's response to the hysteria that surrounds terrorist incidents? is to restrict our liberties and values. And we, we kind of it both ways. I mean, we, we are being hypocritical in saying the police have got to do something to stop these terrible things occurring. A tiny number of people, I'm afraid, get killed in terrorist attacks. They do get killed, but it's a tiny number compared to crime, all sorts of other evils that are going on. But the response to it is so hysterical, politically and publicly, that they do exactly what the terrorists want. They want you to have your values restrained. They want your liberties curtailed. You want to blame... Uh, ordinary respectful Muslims and persuade them to come and join us. All these things are terribly predictable and simple. We seem unable to address it. We just are unable to address it. And the consequence of that, I think, is that, is that you, you, you have a, a feeling, I mean, social media, which I think is the big problem, rather, um, the press, frankly, we're, we're dead respectable, compared, responsible mm. compared to what the social media put out. And, and the big debate, as I know now, is among social media organizers as to what they should be doing. Um, and and they're, they're in, in the wilder shores of the jungle here. Um, but but we, we, I just repeat what I said at the beginning. We, we haven't yet got the language or the terms of engagement for this debate because I think at the moment we're genuinely driving the sorts of liberties that we really care about, the values we really care about, to the extreme because of our overreaction to these terrorist incidents. Sarah, I'm mm. going to ask you to respond to that. I'm, not, I'm actually not going to respond to that. I'm going to respond okay. to something else. Go on, then. Um, I'm, going to, I'm going to go back to... Um, to the point that of actually our reporting, our, our actual reporting of these events is, uh, we, we have to get it right. And while I do think that our relations with the police have really moved fantastically, there have been a number of things that really have um, shifted our relationships <coughs> over the last <coughs> couple of years, we still are not getting the guidance that we need at the right time. And there is a a feeling, I think, for people who are on the ground, whether it's in crime or in or in terrorism, that actually we're still not being treated as kind of responsible professionals and being talked to in a way that gives us guidance, that enables us not to talk facts, we understand that, but to sort of shift our, our reporting, you know, this actually doesn't look like, we, we don't, you know, we're still working it out, but we actually don't think this is a terror attack. Okay, fine, we'll probably come off it a bit more than if we were... Uh, actually, we are really worried about it. We are, we are working that mm. out, etc. It's about mm. levels of guidance, which, Mark, you do give, but it's actually the people who work with you who need to feel empowered to do that a bit more. And I would implore, and I'm, I hope I'm supported by people in this room who actually are, you know, um, feet on the ground at the moment, um, that are home affairs, crime correspondents who have those particular relationships are treated in a different way and not told to get their information off Twitter. That would be my final um, Mark, I'm going to let you have the final word. Uh, James, I, I wonder if you would like to respond to Simon's point about the fact that we are, in a way, playing the terrorist game by reporting and then we get the more police at Westminster. And, and is it the BBC's job, I suppose, in any way to join that debate? Or do you not see it as part of the sort of discussion you need to have? It's definitely part of our role to, mm. to facilitate those kind of debates, mm. and I, I think we do that. I think we've been talking today more about the primary reporting mm. than some of the mm. discussion debate type mm. programming that we also do. I mean, I, I think that the, the essence of it, and it, it perhaps speaks to a couple of the points made earlier, we feel we have a, a, an audience to serve, licensed payers' money is we're given to us for a purpose, to tell them about what's going on in the world, good and bad. Mm. There's clearly a difficulty, which is some of these actors know 
how that system works. And they are, they are very good at, at working Definitely. in open society and its media. Yeah. And that gives us a lot of pause for, for, for thought. I guess we're at the, the, the kind of terrain of this debate is what you then mm. do about that. Mm. But I don't think the answer could be, and I, I don't think it's being suggested, not report these things. Mm. I actually don't think it's not to report them prominently and not to deal with the various aspects. I mean, we haven't even talked about the question of where there's a suggestion, you know, comes up each time, doesn't it? Was this person on a radar? What, you know, yeah. all of that. There are lots of public interest reasons why it takes time and space to, to report out mm -hmm. these things. And we, we get complaint from our, our audiences if we move off these things too quickly, as, as well as the point that Simon's making, or if we don't do justice to the... To, to people who, who have you know suffered and you know tragically been killed by them. So I, I, I w ultimately I think we are in roughly the right place, even <coughs> if there's a there's a debate to be had about whether we're in exactly the right mm. place in, in in all cases. Rob, final thought from you. Presumably you think you would have had complaints from your readers had you moved on more quickly. Um, the expectation, I think, for my readers was that we would stay with this story, but in the, in the way we were doing it, yeah. because the level of, or the, in terms of the numbers, but also the comments were very positive, that people did want to do something positive, mm. uh, and were, um, but they were far less interested in, in, in Salman Abedi than a lot of journalists were. I think mm. that's, yeah, we haven't really talked about the readers much, but mm. the readers actually didn't want to know much about him, to be honest, and mm. when we did do this lengthy piece, we had to explain why we were doing it, because they're gonna, it was a kind of, I don't want to know about this guy. Mm, I think we need to be mindful, mindful of that. But I think my, my last point, if I could just make briefly, is that uh, whatever we decide to do and the way we cover stuff, the, the Pandora's box is open now in terms of social media, mm. and I think the fact that lessons have not been learned were brought home to me uh, at, the, at the attack in, uh, in, in Barcelona when there was um, a very public space full of tourists with camera phones and there was a terribly graphic video of somebody who walked along, ramblers, clearly mm. identifiable people mm. who were dead or dying. Mm. And that appeared in quite a few fairly well-known, uh, you know, me mm. we'd, we'd, I, I remember that day, I thought, have we learned nothing? <laughs> Yeah. You know, we played. Uh, you talk about playing into the hands of the terrorists. We would th that day. Some journalists were doing the work for them. So, I think you know th this thing has happened several times now. It's not going to stop. Sadly, is it? We've got to you know where, wherever we are on the spectrum of a, d of a debate, we've got to actually continue this conversation to understand how we are going to cover this kind of thing in future. Because on that day <laughs> after after Barcelona, I felt pretty pretty sickened by the stuff I was seeing on on some mainstream media. We've got mm. to, we've got to learn. Mark, I'm going to ask final thoughts from you. I, I, I know you've already answered in a way Sarah's point about you, you know, you're going to be better at giving out information. Um, but perhaps you could focus more on the social media point. I mean, this, this fact that, I mean, it is horrifying that people will take out their camera first before <laughs> dialing 999, isn't it, to take a picture and put it on Snapchat or something. And how, how can you in any way deal with that? So it is a problem. People will take out the camera first and they will film something rather than getting away and yeah. protecting themselves, and they will uh, sort of it's 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 bizarre um, it's bizarre behaviour. Social media will run in the directions it runs, and um, it's it's something you have to think hard about. But there is something. It, surely your purpose as media is that you're authoritative and thoughtful and more evidence based, and you don't just run every every crazy room in the way social media does. So whilst that, and this is a sort of a, a lay person's perspective from your, from your profession, but whilst in some ways that is difficult for you because you're behind the curve, in some ways that's your competitive advantage is that you are authoritative and thoughtful. And therefore, um, I mean, today's conversation, I think it's fantastic you're debating that. I'm really grateful for the, for the invite, as I said. We can, we can always try harder and we can certainly do more to give more advice and try and work harder on that. Um, and I think as the, as the threat has changed and it's become increasingly about propaganda, reflecting some of the things Simon says, I do think you can sometimes think a bit about the balance of what you put out there. So you, so you tell the story, um, but you don't help somebody become the martyr that they sought to become. Right, it's four o'clock, it's time for tea. Thank you all very much to the panel. It's been a really interesting discussion. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs>